In today's lesson, we're going to learn how to do some equilibrium calculations. Learning how to do these help us solve a lot of different problems involving equilibrium going forward for a unit. So it can be used for regular concentration problems, it can be used for acid-base problems, it can be used for solubility problems, and then later it can also be used when we put some of those concepts back together with titration. So Today's lesson is really just working through three typical types of problems and then making sure you get a lot of practice with each different type of problem so you get comfortable with the problem solving process. So what we're going to do is calculate concentrations at equilibrium given different situations. So let's take a look at the first problem together. Let's read through it and then we'll break it down and look at how to set it up and then finally solve it. So it says the following reaction has a KEQ of 8.3 at 700 degrees Kelvin. If you start with one mole of carbon monoxide and one mole of water in a four liter container, what concentration of each substance will be present at equilibrium? So there's a lot of information there. We've already got a balanced equilibrium equation given to us. So let's break down first what we've actually got in the question. The KEQ, that's our equilibrium constant. We learned about that in our first lesson for the unit. Here they give us a temperature, 700 degrees Kelvin. You don't actually need to do anything with this temperature. It just means that it's constant. So the temperature is not changing at all throughout the process. If that did, that would shift our equilibrium like we learned about with Le Chatelier's principle. Next, we've got some starting amounts or initial amounts for our two reactants. We've got one mole of carbon monoxide and one mole of water. And we're told the volume of our container is four liters. That information is going to be helpful for us because we need to convert that into a concentration to start. And in the end, when we solve for this question, they're asking us what's the concentration of each substance reactants and products present at equilibrium. For us, concentration will always be in moles per liter unless otherwise indicated. So if you have to solve for a concentration, assume that it's moles per liter. Okay, so off to the side of your paper, somewhere you might want to make a little note, how do you calculate concentration? We've done this a little bit before, but let's just make sure we all remember concentration is equal to moles over volume. So for both of our reactants, they have the same number of moles, one mole. And if we divide it by the volume, it's already in four liters. Our units are correct, moles in liters. That means our starting concentration for both of our reactants is 0.25 moles per liter. So that's great. So now what do we do with it? Equilibrium problems are a little bit different because you have the forward reaction and the reverse reaction. So we have to consider both ways. So it's not just like a standard stoichiometry problem. We have to set it up a little bit differently. And we use something called an ICE table. Now it sounds a little bit silly, but ICE is an acronym. The I stands for initial, the C stands for change, and E stands for equilibrium. And they're referring to concentration for all of those. So let's make a note of this. I means initial, C is change, and E is equilibrium. And we'll just keep that nice and short. And all of these have to be moles per liter. So you don't have to write out all of those words every time. You could just write ICE and then go from there. And literally, we are going to just make a table and subdivide it based on our reactants and on our products. So since we've got our initial or starting concentration for carbon monoxide and water, let's put it in. And to make it easy, don't worry about the units in this chart here. There was nothing given to us about our products. So you can either leave it blank, but I usually like to cross out the starting amounts. And then I know that there's nothing there to begin with. Then I have to work on filling in the rest of the chart. In the end, I want to end up with numbers at the bottom and figure out what they are at equilibrium, but I need to do some work first. 
So I have to start with this change column. And this is where a little bit about Le Chatelier's principle actually comes back and is in handy. So if we go back to that analogy with the seesaw, this is our reaction. It's not at equilibrium when we only have amounts for our two reactants. If you imagine our seesaw, it would be really heavy on the reactant side. Over here, we have lots of our reactants and no products. So to reach equilibrium, we know we have to shift some of that weight over to the products. Or what that means is we have to make some hydrogen and we have to make some carbon dioxide. And to do that, we have to convert some of our reactants to products, which means these are gonna change and they're going to lose and these ones are going to gain. So here's where some of your stoichiometry comes back in from grade 11. So we know carbon monoxide is going to decrease. We're gonna lose some of this moles, number of moles, but we don't know by how much. So a negative sign is gonna indicate a decrease. And then we look at how many moles do I have in my equation? There's one mole here. So I need to represent one mole here, but we don't know exactly how much that is yet. So we're just gonna use X, one X for one mole and a negative means we're losing. Then we go over and do the same for water. We know the water's going to lose when some of the products gain. So it's also going to be negative. And again, look up here, there's one mole of water. So one X goes in here. Then we follow along with our products. They have to increase. We have to make some of them. Something's gonna be produced. So they're gonna gain by the same amount, one mole. And here there's also a gain, one mole of carbon monoxide, one X. If there was a two in front of the carbon dioxide, then you would put plus two X. If there was a three, then you would put three X. That just depends on your balanced equation. So that's how you fill in the change column. Once you've done that, then to get your equilibrium representation or concentration, it's a combination of the first two. So at equilibrium, my concentration will be 0.25 minus X. Down here, same thing, 0.25 minus X. And here we have nothing plus X. So it will just be X. And here, nothing plus X. It will just be X. So there's our ice table all completed. And now we have to try and solve for X. But this again is something new. We haven't done this before. So how do we actually get there? If you think back to our first lesson, we spent some time practicing writing equilibrium constant expressions. And that's exactly what we need to do here to help us solve the problem. So if we were to take our equation, carbon monoxide, water, produces hydrogen, and carbon dioxide, we're gonna write out a K expression for that reaction. So KEQ, your products go on the top. So hydrogen, the exponent is one because there's a coefficient of one. Carbon dioxide, coefficient of one. And on the bottom, carbon monoxide, and then you've got water. All of these all have exponents of one again because the coefficients are all one that are there. Then we're gonna start to fill in some information. So what's KQ? If we scroll back up to the question, that was given to us. It's this number up here, 8.3. So we can put that right into our equation. And then what do we do for the concentrations of our reactants and products? Remember, this is representing at equilibrium. So that chart that we just filled in, everything at equilibrium, these values here that I'm highlighting in green, those are the ones that we're gonna stick into this expression. So we're gonna substitute in where we see carbon monoxide, we're gonna put in 0.25 minus X. And then where we see Water, same thing, 0.25 minus X. And then X and X are gonna go in for our two products. So let's go ahead and do that. So we've got X, X, and on our bottom, 
minus x and 0.25 minus x. After you've done that, at this point, you're solving for x. There's no chemistry here, it just becomes a math problem. So guess what you have to do? You've got to do some math. So take a minute, pause, and think about how would you actually go through and solve for x? What have you learned in your previous math classes? Does anyone remember the quadratic equation? You'll probably have to use the quadratic equation at some point. But luckily, sometimes we can be a little bit more clever and use a little bit more of our math knowledge to solve for x, which you can do in this case. It won't apply to all problems, but in this example, definitely we can. So how are we going to solve for x? Let's just rewrite this expression so it looks a little bit different. x times x, x squared. And on the bottom, we have the same expression multiplied by itself. So guess what we could do? We could also square it. Now looking at this, does that make that a little bit easier to solve? Anyone have any ideas of what you could do here? If you thought about taking the square root of everything, you're on the right track. That makes it a lot easier. So if we did that, take the square root of everything, top and bottom, or you could do the whole expression. You're going to get the square root of 8.3, whoops, which is not 8 again, which is going to be 2.88. And that's going to leave us with x, and that's all over 0.25 minus x. And that looks a heck of a lot easier to solve rather than doing quadratic equation. Now, if you didn't notice that at this step here, that you could take the square root of everything, not a big deal. You could still use the quadratic equation and it'll never fail you. It's just going to take you a few extra steps to get to your answer for x. So pause the video here and let's see if you can solve for x. All right, if you've given it a fair shot, then follow along as we solve the rest of the problem. So I'll do this in a couple of steps just to make sure that everyone knows what they're doing. You need to cross multiply, and then you're gonna have to gather like terms. I'm not keeping every digit in my answer, but you don't wanna round too much until the end. Remember significant digits, that's where they come into play. So, in the end, x should be about 1.86. And remember, x is representing our change. And this value here, since everything in our ice chart is in concentration, it technically has a unit of moles per liter. So, we're not done the question yet. We're not solving just for x. The question said, what are all of our concentrations at equilibrium? So, what we really have to do, if we scroll back up to our ice table, what we have to do now is go back and say, okay, well, what's this concentration, 0.25 minus x, for my reactants, and then make a statement about my products and their concentration. So it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but down at the bottom, you want to conclude. So you could say something like, x is going to be equal to my concentration of hydrogen and my concentration of carbon dioxide at equilibrium. So we know it's going to be 0.86 moles per liter. And then make sure that you round your answer to correct significant digits. If you haven't had a chance to think about that, take a quick look at the question and see how many digits you need. And hopefully you should see because you've got two values of two significant digits, 8.3 and 4.0, you need two significant digits in your answer. So you should get about 0.19. Then we have to go and do our concentration for our reactants. And we know they're both the same in this case. So don't make it more complicated again. You could say they're both equal and we know that's 0.25 minus 0 0.186. And when we do that, we get 0 0.064 and that ends up working out to two significant digits. 
So there's the answer to the first problem. Hopefully that helped you solve, uh, or sorry, see how some of the equilibrium problems are solved. We're going to use ice tables a lot going forward with our calculations. So I'm going to stop the video here, and in the next video, we will tackle problem number two uh, and problem number three. And we'll speed it up a little bit, giving you an opportunity to practice setting up some ice tables and look at some other scenarios.